Emeritus in the Department of English at the University of Missouri. He is a folklorist, disability activist, musician, and author of the memoir, The Secret Life of a Black Aspie. Prahlad will suggest that in a society that is racist, to be black is to be traumatized and to be disabled. Analogously, in a society that is based on neurotypicality, to be autistic is to be disabled. According to Prahlad, the same ableist society that creates those disabilities also manufactures a cure that is in fact a poison. And for those who did not see them, I put scare quotes around the word cure. The poisonous cure is either to conform to norms of whiteness and nor neurotypicality or to disappear. Rejecting that poisonous cure, Prahlad will prescribe what we might call genuine healing. Our second speaker, Anne Millet Gallant, is an art historian and disability studies scholar who teaches at the University of Greensboro, uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and is the author of the memoir, Remembering, Putting Mind and Body Back Together following traumatic brain injury. In 2007, Anne suffered a traumatic brain injury. In her remarks, she will use the term cure without scare quotes, and she will suggest how even a true cure is importantly different from healing. While Anne would have welcomed being cured of some of the distressing symptoms that resulted from her traumatic brain injury, cure of those symptoms was not possible. But what was possible was to heal. As Anne will explain, it was possible for her enmeshed in her community and engaged in her art to flourish in her own new way. Our third speaker, Anne Nakamura, is a cultural and visual anthropologist at the University of California, Berkeley. And she will speak about the way in which the idea of cure is often wholly irrelevant to someone's ability to flourish. Rather than needing any sort of cure, Karen will speak about disabled people needing tools, tools for hacking, environments that weren't built for atypical bodies. Again, it is not atypical bodies that need to change, but unsupportive environments that need to change. After our three speakers have offered their remarks, Rosemary Garland Thompson will facilitate a brief conversation among them. And for the remainder of the event, Joel Reynolds will facilitate the conversation with all of you in the audience. It is now my pleasure to turn the Zoom mic over to Prahlad. Prahlad. Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. I am in a black man's body. I'm dark skinned. I have on a hat that my dreadlocks are tucked under. And I'm against the background of an orange wall that has some white paint at the bottom. I'll begin by talking briefly about my disabilities to put the rest of my comments into perspective. All of my disabilities have been socially imagined or politically engineered by white American institutions. My first disability in American society is my blackness. For since the 15th century incursion of Europeans into Africa and the subsequent slave trade, blackness and the white imagination 
has been constructed as both a physical deformity and a mental impairment. So racism is a widely unacknowledged form of ableism. My second disability is PTSS, post-traumatic slave syndrome, an intergenerational trauma that affects most people of African descent in the Western hemisphere. My third disability is my own PTSD, trauma from the ongoing racial abuse in my own lifetime. The fourth disability I'll mention here is my autism. Like many from my background, I think of the idea of curing disabilities as a fairy tale spun by white institutions and sold to the masses. It's like the tale of the ugly beast that kisses a beautiful princess and is suddenly transformed into a handsome prince. It exploits people's suffering and offers them false promises. It invites us to think of disability as an individual issue and distracts us from focusing on collective and systemic problems. It translates into fixing us, which means making us into something that conforms to a white so-called normal. And so cure is as much or more about culture as it is about medicine and health. Meanwhile, some of us are so different that society declares us unredeemable, too broken to be fixed, too different to ever become anything close to the right normal. For us, the recommended cure is more explicitly exile, genocide, or eugenics. The actual goal then is really to cure society of us more than it is to treat what ails our minds, spirits, or bodies. I remember as a child growing up in rural Virginia, a stone's throw from the plantation where my ancestors were slaves in the age of segregation. We had little access to health care other than natural remedies. We were exiled from white society, except as house cleaners, nannies, or manual laborers. We were disposable. And meanwhile, in the nearby medical hospital, scientists and doctors are busy experimenting on black bodies of men, women, and children. They were using them like lab rats to experiment and develop medicines and treatments that would ironically be, to not be denied to those like them. While many things have changed since segregation officially ended, many things have not. I dare say that for large percentages of black disabled people, perhaps for disabled people in general, being able to truly flourish is still as elusive as it ever was. Under slavery, able-bodied and disabled black people found ways to subvert the system, to take care of themselves as best they could to maintain positive self-identities, and we have continued to do so. But in the end, the enslaved were still enslaved. And in many fundamental ways, our modern lives are still shaped by similar forms of oppression. The system we live in is brutal, inhumane, and sadistic, and it values money, things, and winners above human dignity and well-being. It perpetuates the most superficial ideas of beauty and dismisses any profound concern with developing the inner life. Still, we survive, we subvert, we sometimes achieve and excel, but how often do we truly flourish? To use myself as an example, I've been able to have a career, families, and to be fairly successful as an author and scholar. But in my 67 years on planet Earth, I've never had a day where I felt safe, where I was not afraid or anxious, where I was not looking over my shoulder, or where I was not reeling from a combination of transgenerational and present day trauma in which I was not on the edge of losing my fragile grip on my ability to socially function 
and end up either institutionalized, homeless, or otherwise removed from society. Every day I have felt viscerally my health deteriorating as a result of the stigmas attached to my disabilities. It is well documented that environmental racism, a form of ableism, is a leading cause of physical and mental illness among Black people, as well as a major reason for as short life expectancies. This also holds true for many other forms of disability. I've had moments in which I flourish, certainly, but as I weigh those against the days and months and years of mental and emotional distress or debilitating physical pain, I am more saddened than uplifted. It is not enough for us to think in terms of just surviving or stealing pieces of dignity here and there. I believe that dignity, care, and the right to flourish should be guaranteed for everyone, not for occasional moments or as goals we have to wage endless battles for, but as givens from the moment of our births to the moment when we exit this plane of existence. And we no longer have the luxury of time to wait for change. If the system isn't radically transformed, and soon we will all be facing economic and social collapse that will lead to unprecedented and widespread suffering and despair. And as always, those of us who are the most vulnerable will suffer the most and be considered the most expendable. Despite the enormity of injustices like the pandemic and environmental racism, we need to be actively imagining a different kind of society, a different kind of world, one in which community and understanding connections with each other and nature are the rules, not the exceptions. To do this, we will have to throw away the book of white capitalist fairy tales and create new stories that reflect a different vision. The tales we have been raised on tell us that human beings are strong. They can do amazing things with their minds and bodies, withstand impossible conditions, conquer any obstacle. The truth is actually a little different though. Human beings are incredibly fragile. They break easily. They have a difficult time facing problems. They tend to elevate physical and technological achievements above quality of being. We need to create stories in which the most important achievements are those that happen inside our hearts, spirits, and minds. The old stories have also taught us to think as, of people as individuals. We have the self-made man and pulling ourselves up from our bootstraps, etc. But this is also a kind of fairy tale. If I can use myself again as an example, as an artistic, synesthesiastic person, not only having my senses overlap, but also having physical empathy, I have never felt the sense of I-ness that I understand is considered normal. My eye has always included those around me, but also the natural world. For example, birds, trees. I am the cardinal that sings outside my window in the morning. Not metaphorically, but really. And the cardinal is me. It's one of the reasons why I can't imagine flourishing as an individual thing. How can I flourish if all the me's aren't? How can I flourish if my brothers and sisters are in pain or are dying? If the bees and butterflies that are a part of me are dying. And so our new stories have to reflect the interconnectedness between all forms to impart the idea that all of our well being depends on the well being of all. And so, in the end, it is society that really needs to be cured. The society in which, for example, sadistic personality disorders, Delusional disorders among those in power are considered normal, even admired, in which all too many have fallen under the spell of ableist fairy tales that malign all but the most narrow ideas of beauty. 
rationalize the bullying of those who are different and celebrate the most superficial notions of what it means to be human. For now, those of us who are in society's eyes different would continue to find ways to inscribe our realities in the public consciousness, to fight for change, and to envision a society and world in which fundamental healing becomes more of a focus than cure. Hi, this is Liz. Um, we're gonna move along to Ann Millet Gallant next. Thank you, Prahlad. And you're okay. muted. Great. Okay. Um, are the slides up? Uh, they will be up in one oh. one second. My identity as disabled is multifaceted. My medical diagnosis at both in Ohio was congenital amputation of all four limbs suggesting that I had no visible arms or legs. Such terminology points to what is missing or has been lost, rather than describes my asymmetrical physique. My limbs never developed in my mother's womb fully, and she and other loved ones both to make me feel complete. I am further privileged as a white academic. I hold a PhD in art history, published my research on the representation of disability in art and visual culture, have strong support systems and adequate financial resources. Others have complimented my adaptability and for the most part, positive attitude. I was, am, someone of whom most people agreed knew myself well, and I saw myself as shining a bright light on all of my projects. In May 2007, I was vacationing with a good friend in San Francisco, and at the end of the rigorous day of sightseeing, I lost control of the lightweight travel scooter I was driving tipped over the curb and came crashing down on my head. Luckily, I had been told this was close to, to a hospital that was a premier trauma center. Luckily, oh, I later let a note my sister took while there, stating that someone told her that, had I been taken elsewhere, perhaps no one would have tried saving me. Other notes my father wrote revealed that when I arrived at the hospital, I was within 20 minutes of dying. He also knew his frustrations that no one was allowed to ask questions. I have led the physicians with you to make any predictions about the results of traumatic brain injury, TBI, characteristically, because of the diversity of its effects, not to mention the inconceivability of most people of trauma. I healed over several years with intense physical therapy and art therapy sessions. I need healed, not cured. This distinction is crucial. My healing practices would use any expectations that I could or should to return to an imaginary pre-trauma state of wellness. My brain and my body have fought many battles together. After being fitted for prosthetic legs twice while suffering unbearable muscle spasms, lack of sleep, and an unexplainable bone infection, I decided to forego the prosthetics and be comfortable in my own skin. I had documented the vital signs that my loved ones recorded and my reactions to my medical records, time spent in multiple hospitals, work with art therapy, and the myriad emotions and anecdotes that comprise my trauma story. In 2017, I self-published a memoir composed with years of journaling, researching TBI in art therapy, and making artwork. This creative project proves to be therapeutic still. I portray my corporeal and mental differences from the so-called preferable state of normal through academic and personal writing, multimedia collages, and tactile, vibrant hues of acrylic paint on canvas. Painting, drawing, and collaging personal and commercial imagery enables me to explore the tension between my pre-trauma senses, applied and agency, versus the guilt I felt for having been so responsible for a transformative accident. Neurologist, you can go to slide one now. Neurologist Ruby Coates states that anxiety and depression are the most typical results of CDI, 
and that feeling guilty constantly signals depression. But just supposing pictures that spoke to me about my increased anxiety, sleep disturbances, and losses of self confidence, I healed many wounds. Collages helped crystallize my memory and synthesize my past and present experiences in visible forms that I curated myself. Creating visible reminders about my mind and body's amusements and trauma helped me envision my experiences in tangible artistic forms. Scholars and practitioners assert that trauma cannot be expressed in words due to its complexity and personalized nature. Research in physicians' accounts of TDI have discovered the multiplicity of outcomes and consequences of it, and that a survivor's future is dependent on the personal and community resources and identities and actions prior to TDI. After impact, I was comatose for six weeks, followed by alternating states of revival and consciousness, and somehow I decided to survive. I was accomplished already, and I wasn't finished. The goals of art therapy are to heal rather than to cure. Making art, storytelling, and analyzing my artwork with a therapist did not erase my traumatic past, but rather helped me cope with new impairments and refashion my body images. Over time, I had become more confident and resilient. I traveled from San Francisco to Columbus, Ohio in June 2007, where I had many resources already, and because I was practically uninsured. My father liquidated my savings and investments carefully so I could qualify for Medicare disability insurance. A journalist published a human interest story about me in the Columbus Dispatch titled Willpower that featured a large close-up of my face, wearing makeup and earrings to offset that I had lost part of my skull. In 2010, I, felt it, I found it and felt startled. I recognized myself as a deer caught in headlights. I recreated the photograph as a drawing with ink and light out, placed specifically at the side of my brain, brain trauma to emphasize my eyes and accentuate my drama and humanity. This image is now on screen, a black and white drawing of my face looking straight ahead with short cropped hair. For today, okay, we're the next slide. Well, today, I collaged three printed images of my paintings from the past 11 years by adhering them to a canvas painted orange and with three accompanying words, trauma, drama, and mama, placed below them. My depiction of the inside outside view of my brain after it was severed is less justified. An exterior depiction of my cranium with the image of a red cabbage cut in half, whose intricate painted ridges resemble the inside of my brain rests on it. Cabbage is an offensive term that chastises people who are not normal. Additional acts of social stigma in the forms for examples of others asking what happened to me and how long I have do been doing things for myself attempt to enforce my explanations. Others' analysis of my experiences, such as, you will just how like everyone loses their minds as, my as they age, make me defensive and irritated. Sometimes I turn these interactions into teachable moments. Other times I reply it no, and then often in varying terms, born this way. Contrasting with others' dead tan associations, my cabbage is bejeweled and adorned with a ghoulish dancing center. In, in hues of rose and grape, this tactile shell pumps with light. Next, I hear the painting inspired by my perceptions of the documentary film my beautiful broken brain at the, at the light of a vibrant cabbage. This image of two shapes in blue hues floating on a rosy background includes at last a cat and at the light a brain and face depicted abstractly. I sketched some brain scans and incorporated as my eyes the signature swirl I crafted through art therapy and that I envisioned rotating outward to lead my anxiety and the lingering muscle contraction in my one wounded knee. The third image of my left arm picturing my fluffy, honey colored tabby cat, Waffles, whom we, me and Paul, named to tell us our other lovely, lovely cat, the chicken, is right justified. Dealers should interpret self soothing, literally and metaphorically. It references my lowest moments to cats and my relationships with other mothers. 
Class paper with rosy polka dots frames the three images as an element of whimsy and delight. These borders overlap for me cerebrally and somatically. Spelled out in a hybrid font with more swirls are three terms that name each canyon, trauma, drama, mama. These terms line and provide names for my roles in life. The collage faces three separate representations and links them to articulate my multi multidimensional journeys. This trio references self-care, care, and interdependence. I will never be cured, but now I have the tools I need to feel healed. Thank you. Now I will, it is my pleasure to turn the digital mark over to our next speaker, Karen Nakamura. Hi, um, everyone. It's delightful to, to um, see you today. Thank you for coming. I'm really um, honored to be here. So today I'd like to talk about what I see as the Crips dilemma, whether we cure ourselves or hack the world. The cure and the three C's. Why are disabled people so hesitant about the cure? Perhaps because it always seems to invoke other C's. Control, compliance, conformity. We can perhaps see this most aptly in psychopharmaceuticals used to control people with psychiatric disabilities, such as myself. The taking of these drugs is often not within our control. We are often forced into compliance, monitored for compliance. And the goal of the drug, quote unquote, therapy is conformity to social standards rather than any alleviation of our own pains. But we can see this in other domains as well. Think of the cochlear implantation of two-year-olds. Here again, control, compliance, and conformity are operant not only in the implantation of the cochlear implant, but also in the post-implantation speech therapy protocols, as chronicled by Laura Malden in Made to Hear. Signing is forbidden. The child must comply to hearing conformity. To take the cure, we have to accept the control of normative medicine, be compliant and conform. Is this really too much to ask? Ultimately, in the end, most of us learn that the way of the cure is futile, that whatever we do to try to conform, we will always stick out, always be the other. Crip scholar Alison Kafer talks about the forestalled nature of Crip futurities, that the cure is always presented as being just over the hill. Six months, two years, 10 years. If we could just be patient and wait for it, we might find it. But I think we've been patient and been patient for too long. And we know the false promises of the cure. We can wait, but it will never come. We were always already human and post-human. Ed Roberts Chair. In the social sciences and humanities these days, it's fashionable to talk about the turn towards post-humanism. That is, tearing down the divide between the human and non-human whether it be to talk about cyborg bodies or the symbiosis of our microbiomes. However, Crips have always known that we were always already human and post-human. In 1995, two months after his friend's death, Mike Boyd dropped off Ed Roberts' wheelchair on the, sm on the doorstep of the Smithsonian Castle in Washington, D.C. Ed's chair revealed the marks and dents of the many battles this disability activist fought for his own civil rights and those of others. At the Smithsonian, it became part of the national collection along with other artifacts, including George Washington's dentures. And I like to think that the comparison is fitting. Ed's chair was very much part of his body like George's teeth. And like George's teeth, Ed's chair was designed to be part of its body, of his body. It had a portable respirator, portable ramp in the days before curb cuts, straps to keep his upper body stabilized, and a joystick positioned in just the right position. Anyone else sitting in Ed's chair would feel, well, feel like they had George's teeth in their mouth. Engineering at home, cripping space. Every disabled person is an engineer. 
is the philosophy undergirding a website created by Sarah Hendren and Caitlin Lynch. It chronicles the household adaptations created by Cindy, who, is a quad, who had a quadruple amputation following a medical emergency. The adaptations are mundane, a way to pour out laundry detergent, a hand clip for a stick of deodorant, but they are also innovative and creative. Hendren and Lynch's point is that we are all engineers and designers, and disabled people particularly so, given that the world is not designed for us and our needs. Every day, we have to engage in hacks, using our canes to operate elevator buttons, putting tactile dots on our appliances to know where the buttons are, letting our service dogs carry our meds so that they can remind us to take them. Artic architect Jonah Price and Crip scholar Mar uh, um, Jonah Keller, sorry, architect Jonah Keller and Crip scholar Margaret Price have written about how disabled people hack spaces, making use of buildings and our built environment in ways that the able-bodied neurotypical designer perhaps never imagined. We find the hidden light switches, the quiet nooks, the clear sight lines, the servants' entrances, the doors that aren't locked, and the underground paths. We convene and create crypt space by our very presence. Deaf spaces. Gallaudet University is the world's only four-year college for the deaf and hard of hearing students. Nestled in Southeast Washington, D.C., its campus was originally designed by Frederick Law Olmsted in 1866. And not to insult it or him, it looks like almost every other college campus in the Northeast. At a time when it was important to stress that deaf students could attend college, it was important for Gallaudet to express this sense of normality. But, the, but by the end of the 20th century, times had changed. In 1988, the Deaf Present Now movement had instilled a deaf man as the first president of Gallaudet. In 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act had ensured everyone could go to college. More quietly though, in the background, deafness had become, well, partly cured. The 1988 DPN movement had been caused in part by the epidemiological and demographic bubble of deaf kids created by a rubella epidemic in the 1960s. The MMR vaccine would ensure that there would be no more future demographic bubbles. Genetic counseling, which Gallaudet itself offers, would reduce genetic causes, and cochlear implant technology could take care of much of the rest. Gallaudet would face a, a future shrinking population of students who wanted to be like the rest of society. In 2005, architect Hansel Barman and a cohort of fiery deaf scholars at Gallaudet created the Deaf Space Project. Its goal was to fundamentally change how buildings and spaces at Gallaudet were designed and created. They made a manifesto about how signing deaf people occupied space and used it to change how hallways, common spaces, elevators, stairs, slopes, paths, classrooms, offices, and even walls were designed and created. Huh. In this paper, I've talked about the difference between curing and hacking space, but what of mad activists? As a mad activist and scholar, I wonder how this cure hacking dilemma applies to us. We have a much more troubled relation with biomedicine than some of our physical or intellectually disabled kin. In my more fiery days, I was fairly anti-pharma. I refused to take the pills that were literally poison. But the world is equally toxic and fighting the world constantly equally draining. And psychopharma does make it easier to just live. And thus, our dilemma. We don't have adequate metaphors for what the literal pill means for us. Is it just compliance, conformity control? Or are they perhaps also the wheelchairs and canes that let us navigate the world around us, make it tolerable for us? How can we mad activists work to, re work to rework the built environment and social institutions so that we don't have to constantly take this false cure? We're still very much at the beginning of our movement and I have few answers. Crip archeologists. 
As an anthropologist, I often wonder if archaeologists a thousand or 10,000 years from now will know we existed. And by we, I mean disabled people. My friend and clip artist, Riva Lera, talks about going to a museum and recognizing one of the skeletons on display as having the same type of scoliosis as her. She imagined the life that this person might have had. Sometimes our disabilities are visible on our bodies, but what about the artifacts we leave behind? The new Gallaudet that's being re redesigned as deaf space will certainly be visible if the archaeologists know what to look for. What about other spaces? Brian Bashin, the head of SF Lighthouse for the Blind, tells a wonderful story of going to the home of a mysterious benefactor who left SF Lighthouse $125 million. He instantly recognized the home as that of a person who was slowly going blind. The tactile art, the magnifying glasses, the bright lamps, the large television screens placed in odd spaces. Would these types of details be apparent to our future archaeologists? Well, only, maybe, if they were blind, would they realize them? I wonder what the traces we leave behind will be. And so I exhort to you, my invisible audience behind the Zoom screen, reject the cure. Try to hack your spaces, hack your world, Leave traces behind, be remembered. Thank you. Rosemary, I believe we're turning it over to you to facilitate the conversation. Okay, thank you. I'm clicking buttons. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for these three wonderful presentations, Prahlad, Anne, and Karen. Um, I have a few questions that are prompts for discussion amongst the three panelists. Uh, so I would invite you all to participate uh, together in a conversation. And um, the first question that I wanted to put forward is this one. So people with disabilities who have managed to flourish and to live lives that most of us would consider to be good are often described as being strong. And I'm using that in scare quotes. And I was struck by the contrast between this stereotype of strong disabled people and Prahlad's point, which seems to me to be very true, and that is, and I'm quoting, human beings are incredibly fragile. Mm -hmm. How can we talk about flourishing as we have experienced it in our own lives? How can we understand that in relation to this fact of human fragility? Anyone want to begin? I my view of the screen. <laughs> we have your voice, Anne. Okay. Um. Yes, I think that people always say you're so strong because you've overcome so many things. And I have overcome certain things like architectural environments that don't accommodate me or structures that don't address me properly, um, doctors that haven't treated me. But, you know, that sort of has made me sort of small. We lost you, Anne. I think she, her connection dropped entirely. I don't see her in the participant list. It's a hard technological environment, Karen. It My is. own internet just faded out and I had to get back in again. But perhaps Anand, uh, perhaps uh, Prahlad and Karen would like to comment a bit on this uh, supposed conflict between the idea of strong and the human fragility that Prahlad mentioned to us uh, that is uh, part of what structures our existence. 
Well, I'll try to comment on it. I, when, I think, when I think of strength, and when I'm talking about strength in my talk, I'm referencing the way people tend to think of strength and what they tend to think of as, as strong. Like, you're strong if you can lift 500 pounds or you're strong if you can endure a certain amount of pain or you're strong if you cannot show your emotions. So as I'm thinking about it and talking about it, I'm trying to suggest thinking of strength in a different way. So our bodies are fragile. We don't have fur. If, if you dropped us off at the North Pole naked, we would die. Um, we are so susceptible to so many things, environmentally things, nature things, that it, and it doesn't take a lot really to cause harm to a human body or a human mind or a human spirit. It, it, it in some cases takes very little. So th that's sort of what I mean when I say we're fragile. So I'm suggesting we think of strength in, in, in different ways than it's, than it's typically thought of. For, for example, it takes strength to, to try to understand yourself, mm -hmm. for example, to, it takes strength to, to look at your fear. Those kinds of things are, are what I'm suggesting in, in a way would be more meaningful way to think about being strong than the typical ways that people often think about it. And you were interrupted uh, by technology. Would you like to continue? Uh, talking about strength and strong and Prahlad's concept that, or assertion that human beings are incredibly fragile? Yes, because we're, we're mortal and we're sensitive and you know, we wound and we get hurt physically and emotionally. And you know the idea of cures is the idea of going from a transformation from ill or disabled to non-disabled healthy. And if you see it more as we're all on a continuum and we all have things that we deal with and that we can heal some things for ourselves and some things for other people, but seeking to sort of erase trauma from your life isn't possible. Or, you know, just to ignore it. The traumas that we all go through. And it is, it is really hard to go to therapy. And I chose art therapy because I liked art and I was an artist. And so some, some of our ways of dealing with some of our pain might be through different ways other than just medicine or um, typical exercises or whatever is prescribed. Mm -hmm. Karen, did you care to comment? Uh you know, I think when people talk about being strong, it's often in the context of, you know, oh, wow, you must have had some internal strength to uh, survive the challenges that were presented to you. But from my perspective, I, you know, I live with, with a great deal of survivor's guilt because I know many more people who, uh, you know, um, much more talented, much more much more, yeah, much stronger, and they didn't survive. And it was uh, more luck than anything inherent in myself that um, has allowed me to uh, come to this point. So I don't like the language of, of strength because it, it implies there's something inherent about that. It's more that a whole bunch of us walked across this giant land field uh, minefield 
And a great number of us got decimated. Does that mean that there was anything special about those who didn't? No. And it instead it tends to, uh, sorry, it tends to, uh, uh, you know, it's it's society that's created that minefield, right? It's created an environment that makes it so hard for us to exist. And by praising the survivors, you think, oh, that's so great. You are you cross that minefield like no one. And, you know, it's just like, what? You could not, you could have not put that there. You could have made it so that all of my community could have come across. I'm going to say amen to that. <laughs> exactly. I think all of the, your presentations put forward the, the need for a, what I call a sustainable or a sustaining environment for all human beings to live in, but uh, for people with disabilities, that sustaining environment requires uh, perhaps more and distinctive uh, tools to use Karen's concept, but tools in the very broadest sense the kind of tools that might be technologies, but the kind of tools that might be, and I think Prahlad was suggesting this, uh, other people and other living beings. And for Anne, the kinds of tools that consist of uh, the implements of making art are all part of a larger sustaining environment that has allowed those of us who have flourished to flourish. Um, so I wanted to suggest uh, taking our conversation in, in another direction, and that is that the presentations here that the three of you offered to us um, affirm that it is less us, our bodies and our minds that need to be cured, but rather that society needs to be cured. And I think Karen's concept of control, compliance, and conformity, that lovely alliterative uh, idea is really crucial here about curing society rather than curing us, our bodies and minds. Could each of you perhaps, or some of you talk a little bit more about what kinds of social curing, what elements of society need to be cured in order for us to flourish more effectively in the worlds we live in? I'll, 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 I'll jump in, you know, just for a start. You know, when I was teaching two years ago, disabled students would constantly say, you know, one of the hardest things, especially in, in um, the the community of people who have low energy, the, the so-called, uh, well, we, we call ourselves the Spoonie community, um, it, it's often very hard to get to class. And people had been begging for years and years, hey, why, why can't we have a Zoom option? Why can't we have a Zoom option? Why can't, we, you know, why, why don't, why doesn't all this technology make it easier? And always it was, oh no, we couldn't possibly do that. Oh no, it'd be impossible. And then suddenly a global pandemic hits and it's like, hey, everyone can go do Zoom. <laughs> or, you know, and, and the same with faculty, all these meetings that we went to, it's like, well, why can't we just participate with Zoom? It's like, hey, we can. And, you know, suddenly all these possibilities open and everyone's talking about going back to the old ways. Hey, we're really looking forward to in-person meetings. We're really looking forward to in-person classrooms. And for sure, there are some people for whom that is the more, um, um, you know, accessible option. Um, but we've already seen a bit of the, of the possibilities. You know, I don't think, I think I find Zoom very tiring, um, especially speaking Zoom, where I have to have the video up. So I, I, I do like Zoom meetings where everyone's on chat um, and it really isn't Zoom, but then Twitter. Um, um, but we have now seen some possibilities that society can change, but only changes when uh, it affects the majority of people. 
but not, but now that we can see it's possible, I think there's at this room. So, so I go, go ahead, Anne, please. Well, a lot of the access needs are still medicalized. Yeah. And we have to go see all kinds of different specialists to get a, a new wheelchair. I have to, yeah. you know, or something. And that's an inconvenience to me. And, you know, it's, as I, I, I had to renew my disability license plate and I had to do several paperwork and mailing this and then faxing that and showing up here. And so a lot of these things just turn into a huge hassle. But I think it's good that some in-home present, present, presenting is good. But I've also just feel like traveling has gotten even harder and it's so rushed and people are so packed in together and that makes it difficult. There's a lot of things with access can be difficult. There isn't one solution that's going to be accessible for all people, I, I suppose. But. So you're suggesting that society can be cured by a different distribution of resources. I think we're all yeah. saying that. Um, and a different set of priorities about how we build literally and fund the world that we share together. One, one of the, my goals in, in teaching and one of the reasons I like teaching large classes um, is because I know I'll get at least a few students who'll go on to change the world, you know, who are maybe have the resources and the privilege, but I want to at least sensitize them. Hey, you know, start thinking about these things. And, and maybe I'll also have a few Crips who will do it too. I think as we start to occupy more positions, um, maybe we'll start to have drugs that aren't toxic and don't shorten our lifespan at the cost of being able to exist. Uh, maybe we'll have more devices. Maybe we'll have someone in an insurance company who will have the brilliant idea that maybe someone needs more than one wheelchair at a time. So you don't have to get rid of your old chair when you get a new one. Or maybe someone will design a wheelchair that will work in the rain, uh, uh, you know, a power chair. I mean, all these innovative <laughs> thoughts. But we need to be in those positions to do that. One of the terms that Eric offered us um, in his introduction is the idea of genuine healing, mm. which um, I think is a really uh, productive concept. Uh, what would any of you, how would any of you perhaps describe uh, genuine healing? It seems to me that it's, it's going to require uh, understanding people with disabilities and illnesses as much more than our diagnostic categories, which I think we've all been talking about here, um, to be seen more as whole people rather than broken people, that really difficult metaphor of broken and fixed. And people, and this seems very important in what all three of you said, and it certainly is in my own work, people with dignity that others in the world can recognize. It seems to me that the kind of dignity that we as people with disabilities uh, try to describe in our own work and try to elicit is a particular kind of dignity that must be, that asks to be recognized in distinctive ways. And I wondered if any of you or all of you might have something to say about what this genuine healing might, might be like in your worlds. Well, I'll, I'll say something on that one, but I'm also flashing back to the, the previous two um, conversations that I didn't really say anything because I didn't know what I thought. But this helps me to figure out what I'm actually thinking. I, I, I have a hard time thinking of the, the issues you're mentioning in isolation from 
the society in general. So I was thinking, okay, what, what kind of technology or tool would help an autistic person to function better in the world? Well, there are some things that I could think of, but those tools wouldn't, those tools might serve a few artistic people, but then you would still have a society that was full of intolerant, insensitive people who weren't willing to, to grant an autistic person dignity or, or space or, or to, to think of them with the same consideration that they would with, with someone who, who was not autistic. So if I'm that person and I have to go to work every day and on my job, I have a tool, let's say I have a quiet room that I can go to. Well, when I go to the grocery store, there's no quiet room. When I go anywhere else, there's no quiet room. And so I'm still living in a society where I'm, if I leave my home, I'm sort of being the subject of microaggressions and certain forms of abuse. So it, for me, it, it comes back to a more holistic answer to, to, to those questions than just what might be a tool or technology or environment that might help me. I can go walking in the woods because I'm fortunate enough to live in a place where I can go walking in the woods and where there are woods. But an autistic person living in an inner city especially in a, let's say, impoverished neighborhood, well, they can't go walking in the woods. And in fact, if that person is black, if they go walking at all, they could get shot. So when you ask the question, how would I imagine healing taking place for me? The first thing that comes to my mind would be cure all those people out there. <laughs> and that would allow me the space to actually focus on my own healing rather than using all of my energy just to cope with a hostile environment. <laughs> so, um, I, I can't be, I could go to a retreat but I can't live at a retreat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good place to end with the... Oh, I'll have a, one small thought if I can. Is that okay? Please, please, please. please yeah. we, have, we have a bit more time. Just one, one, one small thought. You know, um, this was a, a little bit that I had cut out of the original paper. But one of one of my friends and a, a, a disability activist in in Japan, um, um, Shinji Kadota, he 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 said he works to envision a world in in which when when a child is born who's disabled, the parents you know the friends of the parents instead of everyone pitying the parents say that is absolutely incredible you know it, you are so fortunate to have given birth to a disabled child because we know that that child is going to change the world and in some ways isn't that what all parents want is a child who will make the world a better place and we and he said we disabled people do that we make the world a better place where we go things magically happen wheelchair ramps get built automatic door openers get installed, quiet rooms at conferences get made, um, uh, you know, um, visible fire alarms get installed. All of the activism that we have done, you know, closed caption television, um, uh, closed captions appear. 
all of the activism that we've done over the past 60 years has made the world a, a better place. And I think, you know, we need to acknowledge that. We need able-bodied neurotypical people to acknowledge that, that we are the ones that bring these changes onto society. And to, you know, so that again, when a disabled person is brought forth to the world, we celebrate that as the marvelous occasion for someone who has that potential for change. Karen, thank you, because you just did the best hack that I, or offered the best hack that I've thought of or heard in a long time. And that is that you just hacked a gender reveal party <laughs> to bring up the idea of a disability reveal party, which would be exactly what you just described. And people could start making cakes and all sorts of technological apparatuses to celebrate. When is this party happening? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll get like, well, I'll go to tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get the NEH to sponsor the whole thing. <laughs> thank you. We can move on now to, thank you so much. We can move on now to the next part of the program. Joel, are you there? I am indeed here. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm gonna uh, keep talking, but if something's going wrong, please interrupt me. So we are now moving on to the section of this event that takes questions from the audience. Um, as has happened with our past events, we have a, a uh, wonderful set of questions and sadly we will not be able to get to all of them. I would like to encourage everyone who's watching, please continue this conversation on Twitter, on Facebook. Please feel free to email any of us. Um, we are really excited to keep this going beyond the event to talk and think together about these um, questions, issues, and concerns. The first question from the audience that I will pose to uh, any and all of the panelists who would like to respond to it comes from Lizette. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, L-I-S-E-T-T-E. -E. She writes, my brilliant disabled friend, Naomi Ortiz, O-R-T-I-Z, shares a story in her book called Sustaining Spirit about how a friend taught her the difference between healing and mending, where mending is not a return to your previous state, but rather a transformation of yourself, where the wound may or may not be there anymore, but you are no longer who you once were. Is there a place for mending on the path to flourishing? Well, I can, oh. So I, thought, uh, I was just asking Joel to read the, the definition of mending again. Yeah, um, th this uh, Lizette writes, <clears throat> mending is not a return to your previous state, but rather a transformation of yourself. A transformation that occurs even if the wound is now no longer there. I can tell it's a good question because we're all like, hmm. <laughs> I think in my in my case, um, I still have a lot of wounds, the visible. And because of what I went through following my accident, I can't use prosthetic legs anymore. But in another way, it means that because it just got too, I had too many problems with my knee and muscle contraction and it just got too much. And I thought it would just be so much more comfortable for me and less painful to just not use them at all. And once I did that, at first I felt like, oh, I'm losing something. But then I just became more comfortable doing things without them. So in a way that I mended in that way, I just sort of oriented my perspectives and, you know, how I did things. And I stopped feeling uncomfortable being on the floor around people. So that was a way sort of mending for me. 
in in terms of psychiatric disabilities i i don't know what healing and mending are um you know all of the cures we've been off offered tamp down the symptoms um or the at least some of the symptoms um but they don't really heal they don't really cure they don't really mend once you stop taking them you're back to where you were which is an odd it's an odd trip i i there's one le- uh term that i that's been used by some uh activists psychiatric activists in japan which i like which is the to use the word recovery um from the language of aa i don't like that it's from aa but i this notion of we are you know i am always you know i am always a psychiatric disabled person even when i'm doing well even when i'm taking uh medications it is always who i am it's in my nature so it's sort of like accepting who you are and working from there so i like that that language i'm always in recovery um but i do the the dimensions i don't like are that it it takes away some of the uh the the activist component and and puts the onus on myself mm. it it would be similar with autism there's no mending or healing um i don't know that there's any mending or healing necessary because i don't think it's an illness um when it comes to ptsd or ptss trauma and let's say trauma related to race well when i think of ptsd i think you, you have a trauma and then there's the after trauma and in the period or the space of the after trauma then you can actually engage ideas like recovery or healing but if you have trauma today and then you have trauma tomorrow and then you have trauma the next day and that's your life then where is the space for actual mending or or healing so um i think that's one of the really disturbing things about racial trauma is people aren't granted the space a post traumatic space really so um so i don't think in terms of as far as my own disabilities healing in that way i think of healing in in moments such as creative moments where one can let's say transcend the trauma um or one can even make it into something else so that it's not what it was at the moment that you experienced it or if you practice yoga or you practice meditation then maybe you're able at moments to take some of the trauma that settled in your body out um but i, I don't know that that would be mending mm. and that's um I have a second question from the audience and I'm not sure this person actually meant to have it thematically come together with the last one but I think this will actually allow us to build a bit um on the comments you each each just made and this question comes from Patricia and she writes I have mixed feelings about Rosemary's discussion around broken and fixed when one is recovering from a medical trauma with newly acquired disabilities there is very definitely a feeling of being broken when one is in a time of crisis and imbalance etc but as one adjusts and learns how to live with your new body mind the new normal then of course that sense of being broken shifts and can shift to simply being okay or maybe even great 
but the point of this, this uh, the person who wrote this question, I think, is to say, aren't there contexts in which it is and should be permissible and acceptable to consider oneself broken? And I just want to add one little thing here that I think one of the reasons this conversation between the three of you is so rich and uh, I felt like I've learned so much is there's been an, a very strong interplay between psychological, psych psychiatric, intellectual disabilities, physical, and also pointing to disabilities that are quite clearly a result of societal injustices, inequities, societal problems. And the complexity of moving between, I think, each of these three domains and showing the ways in which they're connected and not cleanly separated, I think that that's been coming out over and over again in our conversation so far. And so maybe this question is an opportunity just to circle back to the way in which there might be situations where, for example, feeling broken is okay. <laughs> I said, oh, I forgot one more thing. And Liz Bowen pointed this out to me that Anne, one of your uh, paintings is actually called My Beautiful Broken Brain. Yes, I think when Liz Miller was saying that, if you don't mind, I think she was saying that people think in terms of it being broken, not that the person themselves is broken, that other people, you know, conceptualize that. And broken can be an individual experience, and that also, I think, should be open to interpretation. You know, um, I might consider myself broken one day and, and about something that I'm just upset about that day. And I can sort of go through that. I might feel broken from some of my experiences, but then I just find other ways to do things to try to deal with the pain the best I can. I use artwork to, to sort of explore these ideas. And one reason why I study artwork is because it is a creative expression. And you know, we can bring different interpretations to it, but there's always more interpretations. And that's sort of interesting for me to, to study the creative acts um, that can be both in terms of one's society and one's nationality or, and individual at the same time. I don't know if that's helping to respond to that question, but um, maybe it's the problem of classifying book and this as whole as absolutes, mm. you know. It, Broken means different things to different people at different times. It's, you know, it's not something you have to overcome the men's completely, but. Yeah, there's a um, Japanese art form of repairing pottery with gold called kintsugi, where you use gold to to inlay, to, to repair. And you get some really beautiful pieces that have been repaired with that in some ways the broken and repaired piece is more beautiful than the original one. It reminds us, you know, um, to go back to Pallad's point about the frailty and fragility of the world and of things that nothing will last forever. And that each break is unique and each broken piece is unique and how it comes back together uh, is, is also uh, uh, unique. I, I don't think it's uh, bad to refer to ourselves as broken at times. Um, you know, I certainly there are periods where uh, my brain comes crashing down on me. Um, and today is one of them. I, I apologize for my affect. But the, I reminded th these are the moments in which um, it reminds me of my humanity. It reminds me of my frailty. But it's also the moments that also give me the energy to do things later on. So it's not always um, a negative to be broken. And I wanted to suggest, um, as I thank you for that comment, that um, I would want to, for us all to think that these conversations are less about what's permissible and not permissible, what's okay and not okay, but rather that what we're doing is together exploring um, and offering a variety of different perspectives, not rules about how to think and be in the world as 
people considered disabled and people considered not disabled. And one of the things I appreciate about the concept of the humanities is that it invokes the idea of the human and the human is a way to yoke uh, many of these differences and variations uh, that human beings and the larger non-human world bring forward to us and to think about them. So I, I would not want my language and thoughts to be considered permissible or not permissible. Um, nonetheless, thank you for the comment about broken and unbroken. Anand, did you want to jump in or, or should I move to the next question? No pressure, just, just checking. I'll just add a little bit. I, when I think of broken, I actually think of, I think it's a medical creed, do no harm. Um, but in fact, it's very difficult for medical professionals to treat people very often and do no harm. So sometimes the harm does end up leaving people feeling broken in ways that they weren't before they received those treatments. So um, I don't think it's just necessarily whatever disabilities we might have before engaging with, with medical professionals. I think sometimes it's also the result, uh, the side effects of, of medical treatments mm. that can cause conditions that we might feel I'm broken. I feel broken in this way or, or, or that way. And, you know, it's often a trade-off. Well, is, does the feeling of brokenness in that way but this other thing over here is managed better. Is that a better situation than if you didn't have the new brokenness and the thing over here was not being managed? So um, it can get complicated in that way. Yeah, this is also making me think uh... So to make a personal comment for a second, um, you know, much of my my psychiatric disabilities, a, a lot of them are are a result of questions of grief and loss, and separating out what is in relationship to very specific events versus what is just a question of difference and of how I am, but a question of difference and how I am that I sometimes feel very viscerally as being broken. And I sometimes feel very viscerally as a sense of loss. That is a very complicated kind of interplay um, and brings in, uh, yeah, it, it, one can't, one has to think about both environmental and structural factors and individual ones uh, to, to even kind of broach those, those types of issues. Um, one other question from the audience that I, I wanted to make sure we, we got to and I think that this will kind of take this last part of the discussion and open it up even further uh, to one of our primary themes of not only today, but the, this event as a whole, that of uh, flourishing. Uh, this comes from Greg and he writes, I understand Professor Prahlad to be reinterpreting flourishing so as to be lamenting limitations imposed by social factors, and at the same time, accepting personal limits as a feature of all human life and embracing interdependence with others, including the natural world. The, uh, Greg writes, I find this very attractive. Does it not though also raise a conceptual challenge for knowing how to ensure that human flourishing is a right enjoyed by all people. How can we know if one is close enough to being who one wants to be or having what one wants 
or feeling like one can be oneself to be described as flourishing. Can you read the question part again? Absolutely. Uh, Greg writes, does balancing the, uh, let's see if I, let, let me try and rephrase this. Does balancing the tension between accepting personal limitations and acknowledging the massive social limitations that are imposed on us, does, does acknowledging that tension raise a problem of knowing how we can tell whether or not someone is flourishing and how we can establish a world in which there are rights, human rights, such that that is, is maximized, such that flourishing is maximized for as many people as possible. I hope that I did justice to the question by slightly rephrasing it. Maybe the simplest way to rephrase it, now that I'm thinking about it more, is how do we translate these insights from today uh, into questions of human rights? How do we make societies such that more people can flourish with the bodies and minds they already have? Big question, <laughs> very big question. <laughs> I think maybe I would rephrase that as where do we, re where do we begin <laughs> and how can we begin? Because to say how we can accomplish it, I don't think we have that much time um, left to actually map that out. But um, some places that we could begin, I think one of the, the, the main places we could begin is with a different kind of education in K through 12 so that people graduate from high school with a different kind of sensibility about what it means to be a human being what it means to be a human being relative to other life forms on the planet and what it means to be a human being in this particular moment in which we're living right now. And I say that with full understanding of how difficult it would be to transform educational institutions as, as like the public schools, for example. But a lot of things are difficult. I think it's a necessary thing that would make a big difference in the future trajectory of our society if that could happen. I think it's coming, you know, at universities across the nation we've found a uh, there's no university that hasn't had a rapid increase in the number of students with non-apparent disabilities, um, whether it's psychiatric or developmental or, or neurological. And that I think is the success of the ADA that they've managed to thrive in kindergarten, elementary, middle and college in environments and had IEPs that allowed them to come. Now they're coming to college and they're finding barriers and faculty are having to change. But in four, 10 years, that wave is also going to come into society. And we can either um, try to stop, stop it and institutionalize them, but I don't think we can ever go back to that period. I think instead companies and other places are gonna to have to figure out well, what to do with this generation of kids who have thought that a least restrictive environment is the natural, that of course they have the right to thrive, of course they have the right to be here, of course they have the right to everything. So I have a lot of hope for the, for the generation of kids who are born um, after 1990.
One more question from the audience. Um, and the fact that, that Karen, you just brought up the question and, and Anand, you both brought up the question of younger people and especially people going through education. This will make that uh, slightly more focused. Uh, Michelle from our public audience asked, what are people's views about parents making decisions about getting a cure for their young children? How do we help parents to consider all of these rich points that have been brought up about identity, pride, and difference with respect to their children? For me, it's talk to the adults who are living with that disability. Um, you know, whether I think of co either cochlear implants, um, whether I think of, you know, applied behavioral therapy, um, uh, talk to the adults. So many times it's just, you know, able-bodied neurotypicals who are making those decisions or advising. If you talk to deaf people now, about cochlear implants, they'll say, hey, yeah, maybe have it for your child, but realize it's just a strong hearing aid. It won't make your child hearing. And so you should also accompany it with sign language and just see which, which one your child wants, but they have the right to language exposure. So give them both. Give them both English and give them both hearing. You talk to um, adult um, um, uh, autistics who have underwent ABA theory and they'll say, therapy and they'll say, that was horrible. I spent all day with a therapist who was just teaching me how to not to stim. And that's all we did. And that was such a colossal waste of time. There are so many more things I could have done with my life, but we never talked to the adults. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, um, you're not alone. There are other people who have gone through it and they can share their experiences. I would agree that's a, that would be an important way that parents could become better educated about disabilities. Um, on a sort of macro level, I think, again, having some fundamental transformation of our social system would help because a lot of parents are really making decisions based on they, they can't take time off from work or they are afraid that their children are going to be bullied or they're afraid that their children are going to be left behind or have experiences in their, um, in their school or in other situations where they are traumatized because of their difference. So I think if, if parents didn't have to be concerned with those kind of issues, that they would be a lot more open-minded about not necessarily looking for cure, quote unquote, for their children. So I, I think a lot of it is just practical. And if you're a single mother, for example, and let's say you have three children and you have to work two jobs in order to make ends meet, and you have a disabled child who requires a lot of attention, and then you're given the option for them to be cured, quote unquote, or to receive some sort of treatment that would mean that their disability is not as noticeable or that it's, it's momentarily fixed. Well, you can understand that would be an uh, inclination on the part of the parent to take that option. So I think that part of it is really social circumstances that weigh on parents a lot of the time that influenced their decisions. I think that um, one of the really powerful thing that, that came out in, in differing ways from each of your talks was the emphasis on how society so fundamentally shapes what we take to be 
our individual choices. And that those choices are often not really choices at all if you live in a society that's set up in a fundamentally unjust and an equitable manner, a society that doesn't offer universal pre-K, that doesn't offer parental leave, that doesn't provide sufficient supports for parents uh, uh, who have children with differing needs, that doesn't offer universal health care. I think you get my point. I might be referring to the United States in particular <laughs> um, as an especially egregious example uh, of a country presumably committed to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and yet not actually providing the supports for that to become a reality for the vast majority of its citizens. Hopefully, someday that will change. Uh, but speaking of politics, and we will not, um, we do not need to get into details here, but I think that this might be a really important thing to bring up. There has been a debate at the national level over the last few weeks about the meaning of infrastructure. And people have been noticing that in this infrastructure bill, there are things like care for children built into it and care for older people and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I'll just be honest, my whole life, I've always been confused why infrastructure would only refer to roads and bridges when if you don't provide infrastructure for caring for actual humans, like what are we talking about? Nonetheless, um, I would just like to, uh, I'm combining a couple questions from the audience. Can you talk a little bit more about structural supports and infrastructure and the relationship between questions of cure and supports that must be in place for us to even imagine cure in a non-ableist manner? Well, I think cure often uh, suggests that someone doesn't need services that cost money anymore. Hmm. They don't need treatment to cost money of, of whatever kind. And that's problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but things such as uh, therapy in whatever form that a person needs to be funded, ultimately, you know. I, I mean, I'm not an economist, so don't ask me where it's going to come from. <laughs> but, you know, this having, like you said, funding for infrastructure of, of the human culture, too. Mm -hmm. I want to at this point, we're, we're gonna, we're nearing the end of our time, but I'd like to invite Rosemary. Uh, I'd also like to invite Eric and Liz if they feel like jumping in um, and see if there's any, any further questions that they would like to ask, any comments, any, anything that's been said before that maybe you'd like to highlight and circle back to. As, as people maybe don't know, but, um, our speakers are amazing and we get the great joy of working with them, but we've all had the blessing of being in email communication for like, I don't know, eight months now. Um, so it's been a very collaborative process and I know Rosemary, Liz and Eric might wanna jump in here. Um, I'd be happy to begin by saying uh, once again, thank you for uh, these three presentations and for the, to the National Endowment for the Humanities for funding this and for the Hastings Center for structuring this, for Eric and many of the, and Liz and the other people at the Hastings Center, but, but also for an opportunity to think about this incredibly challenging um, transformation that we have all gone through over the last year, many transformations, but I just wanted to call attention to one of them that Karen brought forward. And that is the transformation from um, what we think of as in-person uh, work and in-person uh, events, if you will, and in-person life together in public and what we think of as virtual, because that's such a crucial 
that's one really crucial uh, shift that's taken place in particular for people with disabilities because we, we meaning people with disabilities tend to use technology perhaps differently than non-disabled people. And I don't wanna oversimplify this, but as Karen has pointed out in many of us who work in disability culture and disability studies, the world is designed for a particular kind of person. And thus technologies and the world we live in has not been built for let's just say the kinds of people who um, have are involved as speakers and participants in these conversations. And it's so important to be able to think about how these transformational technologies are operating, how they both are paths to access for people with disabilities and at the same time barriers to access and participation for people with disabilities. And so I, I want us to remember that our part of what we're doing here in this series is to think about that. This series began as an in-person event in New York. The first event was in person in New York and we thought to just videotape it and we'd make that available buried somewhere on the website. Exactly. And we needed to transition to fully virtual events, which we've had now three more events. And they have evolved in terms of people's comfort level in using these and in exploring the, these new complexities of, if you will, disability and technology. And so I thank everyone for being able to address that in a complex way um, here and now. And I think the record of this, these conversations, which will be made into a book that Oxford University Press will publish, will be really important in our retrospective glance at what this year has been for people with disabilities. So thank all of us today for this and for the ongoing conversations. Liz, did you wanna add anything? Be oh, I feel like Rosemary really <laughs> okay. kind of uh, summed it all up here. I guess um, I would just say thank you to all of you um, for you know, echoing Rosemary. Um, the complexity and just and just patience and flexibility that you've brought um, to this project and this process. I think um, one of the things that we've learned through organizing this series um, is just how you know te technology is often positioned as a kind of cure in itself, and even in in sort of conversations about disability, um, the idea that like Zoom has made everything more accessible all of a sudden, and, and you know we ha have learned in our um, grapplings with this platform that it can often be really difficult and you know suddenly the interpreter is not visible and suddenly the captioning is not working and some you know for some people the chat is really useful and for some people it's totally distracting um, and the, there's just all, the, all of these complexities that have to be navigated um, that you know I think one of the things that's really amazing about disabled community is that you know we're, we're all in, <laughs> invested in um, working through that together and, and finding solutions um, and hacks to use Karen's terminology. Um, but you know, it, what has been really powerful about working with you all and in this series is um, you know, questioning the idea that there's, there's these technological cures um, either for our bodies or for the societal problems that we're grappling with. Um, so. I would only uh, reiterate the thanks that Rosemary and Liz have already offered. Um, first of all, to any age. Again, I we just I cannot overstate how grateful I am for an opportunity 
to have a public conversation about the most complicated and important of questions. As Rosemary said, uh, we're not about legislating answers, we're about exploring questions and there's almost nowhere left. Well, there are a few places left where people get to honestly explore together hard questions that don't have crisp answers. And we, we've been able to do that today because of these remarkable, wonderful speakers, Prahlad, Anne, and Karen. Um, I am so grateful. I know everybody in the audience is so grateful to you for what you've given us today. Um, I don't have anything other to add other than to ask Liz, would you please put up the slide where we get to formally thank all of the people who have helped to put together this event? Um, as always, it is many, many people. Um, yeah, I, I'll read those out loud too. Um, great. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Patricia Brooks uh, from the Hastings Center, Mark Cardwell, Julie Chibaro, Susan Gilbert, and Danielle Patia. Uh, thanks to our sign language interpreters who now this slide has disappeared. Why did that happen? <laughs> um, thanks to our sign language interpreters, uh, Mary Derrick McLean, Mike Barrios, and Jamie Hayes, as well as our cart, cart services uh, from Karen Johnson, Andrew Hansen, and Amy Lee. And thank you to all of you in the audience who came here today and uh, asked truly wonderful questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I think it's been a really amazing conversation. Are we officially ending now? Am I supposed yes, to? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm finding the end. <laughs> the end button, it's hard when I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. <laughs>